South America Bird Fair will be next year in Peru, right? The plan is to next be year. there. In Peru. Yes, but perhaps we will have a little meeting in Colombia, if it's possible, at the end of the year. In, well, oh, wow. in, in November. We will try. We will try. We, will, we don't know yet. We hope that will be possible that borders open. I, I can't imagine two years without go out of the country. <laughs> but, uh, but in uh, Colombia, are they, are they pushing through with the Avi Tourism Conference? About what, sorry? The uh, Avi Tourism Turismo Conference yes. this year? No, well, the same. they don't know, but they 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 think that will be possible, and uh, we're thinking that if will be possible, perhaps we can make a meeting there. Perhaps a very little group. We don't know yet, because we always hope that we are close to the end of the problems and the pandemic. That never happens. So, <laughs> all right, guys. Uh, is is okay. It's, it's nine o'clock now. Okay. Okay. So ready, yeah. Victor? Okay. Ready, Horacio? Yes. Okay. Always. Good. Good evening, Asia. Welcome to episode 16 of Beyond Birding. Uh, I'm Mike Liu in Manila with Victor Yu in Taiwan. Uh, this is our last episode, and we have a VIP guest. He is a biologist an ornithologist, a professor, a bird watcher, a bird guide. He is the vice president of the National Association of Bird Watching Guides in Argentina, uh, president of the International Committee of the South America Bird Fair and executive committee of the World Bird Fairs uh, Council. Uh, and tonight he will talk about uh, his participation in a wet wetlands international program to work with local communities in the Ibera wetlands. So let us welcome Senor Horacio Matarazzo. Muy buenos dias, Senor. <laughs> buenos dias, Mike. Perfect. How are you? Very well, thank you very much. Hello, everybody. Nice to be here again. Waiting for to be there in person. But until that moment, we can be, we can see and talk from here. Okay. Okay. So can start your presentation. Perfect. Thank you for the flyer. Okay. Uh, tonight for you, this morning for me, uh, we will talk about one special, very special place that is Ibera Wetland that I want to introduce for you, and you will see why. Ibera wetlands and not only the place, also the experience of the people there, because it was a really transformation with the ecotourism and the bird watching in the place. Ibera, we called in Spanish, and I will talk about the experience. Perhaps you, you know this map of the diversity of the world. Uh, here you can see Francisco, who is from this area completely dark red. And you know where the places where the dark blue is because it's the diversity is low and places with green diversity is high, more in yellow and more in red. South America have 35% of all the birds of the world, but we have also uh, most of the insects, the plant species, uh, when I, I teach at the university, I usually ask the students, where are more mammals in the world, more species? And people say, usually say Africa. And I say, yes, in Africa have more documentaries, but we have more species of mammals also. So South America is where we have more diversity in all meanings. And I, I will talk about one place where diversity is amazing uh, here in is perhaps is where we, we start Southern South America. Let me see. In the voice of the local people that we call Guaraníes, 
Guarani people is the, the original people that is living here for perhaps uh, 12,000 years. People named the place Iberá and say, because I means water and Vera means that shines, so it's the bright water. Uh, it's a place where it's plenty of water, like usually wetlands, but with water in the surface all year round. And depends on the time of the day, you will see the shines. It's a, it's a place which is around 220 kilometers long, 20,000 square kilometers, uh, with swamp, with lake, with course of waters, and some island of forests with palms, with different kind of forests and grasslands. Because all the, the, the wetlands is surrounded by forests, by jungles. It's a kind of rainforest and grasslands. Not, not only the place bright, also some animals that we will see. Like this kind of related to crocodiles. So uh, this is the basin. The second basin in South America is a very big basin with 1.5 million of square kilometers uh, with three big rivers like Uruguay, Paraná, and Paraguay. This is where the, the basin is. It's around uh, 150 million of hectares. And there we have the largest wetland system of the world. There is the, the largest system of the world. It's, it's not because I live in South America. If you see in, if you Google, you will see that this is the biggest systems of wetlands because together is, is included the Pantanal that is a big wetland of uh, Brazil, uh, Bolivia and Paraguay, three countries, the Chaco wetlands, Ibera is where I will talk about and the Delta of Paraná River. It's a system of wetland and it's also a highway of in the migration of the birds that use South America because we have a Pacific Highway and Atlantic Highway at the Central Highway. That's, that's a lot of birds from North America came crossing uh, the one place called the Llanos, a wetland in Venezuela and Colombia and cross inside South America to this system of of wetlands here. It's very interesting, the, the kind of species. But the one interesting thing about Ibera that this is a protected area inside the largest system uh, is around 1. million hectares protected. It's a very big reserve that usually we, we go from Buenos Aires here in South, but it's also possible to go from Asunción that is the capital city of Paraguay. Or some people go from Iguazú after visit Iguazú Falls, that is an amazing place. I will tell you a little more about the different landscapes and different birds that we have in the, the area. From here, from this point to this point, we have more than 200 kilometers. So it's, it's really big. One of the environments is the wetlands. That you know, wetlands is a place where the water is the most important topic of the thing that uh, usually you have water all year round, but sometimes it's not all year round, but the plants depend on this place. Uh, you can see, for example, inside these plants, you also have water, a lot of animals. This is like a, a, a coast of the wetlands. In the Ibera, we have species like macos that I will talk about in a moment, deer, well, caimans, of course, and a lot of birds. One interesting thing about that I love, especially when, when I go there, is not only because we have a lot of species, I will tell you in a moment that we have more than 500 different species, but one interesting thing to me is the number of species because population is very, the human population is very low in the area. And the number of individuals, all, all birds 
it's amazing in the area. It's amazing. Always where you see, you will see a lot of them. The, the other, the, the dark green here in the map is a different environment that we call the Pampa grasslands. These are very flat grasslands, subtropical. Uh, now I, I'm not here in Ibera, now I'm here in Buenos Aires where we also have this kind of grassland around, but around Buenos Aires we have a lot of crops, we, we have a lot of cows, and it's different. And the difference in Ibera that it is protected, in the past it was a lot of cows, but now it's, it's changing. I will, I will show you how it's changing. This is a, a kind of grassland in winter, where we have the, the in Ibera, the biggest bird in South America, the Ria. It's a name that Darwin used it because Ria is a very important uh, goddess in Greek. So we have Southern Screamer. Screamers is a typical family in South America. We are, there are only three species. Some species like uplands and piper that is difficult to find in other places and they live there. It's a migratory species from North America. And tinamus, like the red wing tinamu. Tinamu is, is a bird related to rias, not related to um, partridge or other birds in the old world. And a special bird there is this kind of strange tail tyrant. I love it. Well, in the other side, it was a, the grassland. In the other side, we have all this light green. It's a kind of forest that we call Chaco forest. It's very, very diversity forest than with a dry season. Is the difference with the other kind of forest that is always raining. This is a kind of Chaco forest. I will use a video. It's an open, it's open with thorns, coal. Oops, excuse me. So there we have, well, yellow cardinal is one of the birds that I love. The Sediema is a special group from South America with only two different species. This is the red legged. Sidebill is related, is in an endemic group of the neotropics called the Furnarids. Some families of birds are, are completely different than families in, the, in, in Asia that, that you have in Asia. Um, some of them look like similar, but they are not related. And monkeys, like this howler. This is a black and golden howler monkey. I love the sound. And the other kind of forest, number four here, this, this special color, is a, is, we call Atlantic green forest from, that we have from here to the coast of the Atlantic, is inside the Amazonian domains. And we have around the water in, especially in north of Ibera. The interesting thing that is when you change the environment, you change the kind of bird that you can see there. Perhaps all of us love to be in this kind of environments, water, rainforest, birds like trolls, like woodpeckers, like puff birds is a typical family in South America and Euphonias. So, as, as I tell you, Ibera have a lot of species, a lot of them, lots of species and lots of individuals. They, uh, for example, last big day that we have two, two times, twice a, a year, we have a big day organized by Ebert. Um, we saw in Ibera, for example, we saw uh, in a group, I have been there and we saw 100, 47 species during the day. So it's a place where you see a lot, you see a lot. Uh, including, for example, Puchus that we have. This is a Puchu. It's a, a bird that 
you you can't see because it's part of the tree. There is the one of the, the parents, and here is the cheek of the putum. This is one of the 12 species of hummingbirds that we have there. I, I choose my favorites, personal favorites. Uh, the black-throated mango. You know, South America, we have the South America and North America, but more in South America, we have a lot of hummingbirds. This is an Andai parakeet, is one of the 10 species that you can see in the place. The crowned solitary eagle, one of the 35 species of bird of prey. Because in Southern South America, we have a lot of bird of prey. I don't know exactly why. Because we have a lot of species and it's actually it's very easy to see them. Uh, and I love that, that, but we have a lot. And perhaps one of the most important groups of birds are the, the family of the Tana shirt. Now the, this family includes a lot of things that we don't call Tana shirts, like for example, seed eaters or different kind of finches, like warbling finches, um, even some kind of cardinals. But this is, for example, the Wira Tana shirt. This is one of the 48 members of this amazing family. This is another family also you can see in neotropics. When I say neotropics, I, I mean south of, from uh, Mexico to all South America. I'm, I'm drinking mate, it's a typical drink instead of coffee. So this is Esteros de Libera, Ibera. And the nature, as you can see, is, is amazing. So people who, who used to live for the last thousand of years, this is the area, is more related to, to cows. And in the past, the area was really isolated. Um, and people hunt all kinds of animals. And when people start to, to grow cows, uh, start to kill the, the animals that could be a problem, like jaguars, for example. And some of the animals uh, was extinct perhaps 100 years ago or 150 years ago. Uh, the area have very bad uh, roads and still now. But in the last 20 years, the change started when even the government understood that could be a very good opportunity to develop the kind of ecotourism related to the nature, the nature that still is, is wonderful. Even when some, some species were uh, extinct in the area. So now all the one million and a half hectares of the area is protected the government start to, to create programs with the local people and with the support of a lot of organizations. Uh, Mike say, uh, talk about wetlands where I'm also working, but there are a lot of organizations working in the last perhaps 20 or more years in the area. And around the wetlands, there are a lot of towns that we call portales in Spanish mean like gates to, to the nature. This is, for example, one of them. This is a, a, a town, one of the oldest related to the tourism we call Pellegrini. And we start, we, because me too, but a lot of people start to, to work with the people to improve the skills in tourism and to guide, to know about nature and to involve the people because we know that it's like kind of a uh, virtuous circle, we say, because more, more conserved the area, people will, we can work in tourism and generate uh, more money for them and they will be more involved in conservancy of the area on the resources, even children and adults. In the last two years, for example, we, we changed 
and we improve our skills in like all of us in virtual media because in the, in the people use it of course too and also we had some personal activities in the area so people of the area uh, had lead these kind of activities in the last 20 area more and more working with people from the whole world guiding and sailing and from all so the last important thing that happens with this movement with this activity with the improving of the the wild of the place and improving the the quality of the life of the people um uh, mike is talking uh, is it was a, a very important program to rewild the area and to reintroduce the species uh, it was a, a person very important called uh, Douglas Tompkins with a conservation land trust that he started with this idea and now there are an organization called rewilding in Argentina with the governments and a lot of people they started to reintroduce and for example after more than 100 years ago the macos are still living wild in the area and breeding in the area and some species like the bear face curaso the shower come back to the area because we have in argentina the curaso on shower but we haven't here in exactly this area the anteater and now they are, are protected the giant otter the color peccary so all these animals start to come back again with a very interesting program and now are part of the activities that people can do when go to, to Ibera. Ibera is still, is now rewilded. It's very interesting experience. And people who live there are very happy about that because more people are coming from the whole world to, to know the place. So for example, I, I will tell you the story of Jose who is this man, and this is the house where Jose born. I hope Jose is, is looking this presentation because I, I sent the information. So Jose always told, tell about he uh, was, the family was very poor when he was a child, this different kind of poorness. And he know some of the, he knew some of the birds uh, on the food at home. So Jose now and Estrella are owners of this hotel and they have a life that perhaps could be impossible without the tourism. Most of the people or 80% of all the whole people of the area change the, the activities, change the life in, in tourism now. And they are very involved in the conservation of the area. It's, it was really, really interesting experience because it's, you can see there exactly how the ecotourism and the bird watching can change the life for better of the people involved in this. And of course, it was very better for, for the, the environment, for the wetlands and for, look at Jose now always with binoculars and you, the local people use, usually have a knife, a big knife, in this area he has a book so uh you can include this special place because it's a place very easy to go it's very safe uh, it's connected because if you come from buenos aires or from asuncion you have direct flights you will be there in one hour and in one hour more driving you will be in the estero de libera it's a cheap area, international prices, uh, with very good lodging and places to go. And I hope you can include this area in the future of your activities. So I, I thought to have more information, but Mike and Victor, uh, this is the end. It was a short talk. Uh, 
All right. It's a beautiful, so it's short, but still excellent, full of information. Thank you. Thank you very much. Really great, really great. Thank you. Are there any kind of questions in Facebook? Yeah, we have a little mistake today because uh, I, I broadcast on um, my personal page of Facebook, not ABS page. So I, I post the link of the, the live on Facebook on our ABS page. I hope people can watch it. Yes, uh, now you, you, you can stop sharing your presentation. All right, guys, now it's your time. Yes. Let's talk with, yes, Francisco. You, you're, you're, you're muted, Francisco. It's just raise your hand. You, you, you have any question or you want to talk? Yes, go ahead, Francisco. I wanted to ask uh, how easy it is to see giant and eater that I saw in the picture and jaguars in Ibera. Yes, both species were reintroduced recently, and at the moment it's not easy. Um, only if you go exactly where the places where they are working, people of rewilding are working in this experience. But uh, the, the idea is to have more and more because they start to breed just now and perhaps in the next 10 years will be easier than now. People, but, people want to have a place like Pantanal where it will be easy to see them. But in the place where they are working with them, is it easy to photograph them? If you go with people with rewilding, perhaps, they can they can show you ah, okay but it's not completely that you will see everywhere or you know where exactly not okay. at the moment not it's, it's a new thing perhaps in i like i say in 10 years but not now okay thanks thank you scott thank you for the presentation horacio i'm, I'm looking at the map the ibera region you are talking about is there's several countries around that share that same area like Uruguay? And, uh, do they have to cooperate? How do you go between the countries and do they work together? Um, some programs, people work together. They are, for this is a map that you you said. Yeah. Uh, yes, yes, we, we have a lot of things that we work together with people from Paraguay, from Brazil. Uh, the, the reintroduction programs, even rewilding is an international organization. Wetland is also an international organization that we work together, for example, Pantanal, Iberá, and Delta. Yes, no, no, it's not a problem. Of course, now all borders are closed now because of the pandemic. But we, we can still be in contact, of course. But you, you travel, looks like the, you can travel between countries. The wetland covers several countries, right? Four countries, maybe? Or yes, parts of four countries. Yes, now you can't travel no. between countries, but now, but usually always and in the future will be, people go, for example, from Iguazu, from the Brazilian side to the place of Paraguay, came from Paraguay. Yes, no, no problem to move between countries. Thank you. Very soon. Uh, uh, yes, 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 Keith, yes. Oh, hi. Uh... I spent a day at the Ibera wetlands with uh, Adrian uh, Heredia uh, three years ago. Wow. Yes, it was I remember. A, wow. Yeah, it was a wonderful experience. And I, I wonder how, how many days I would have to spend in order to you know, travel the whole expanse of the wetland. How many days? No, yes. I think if you be, so if you go there, uh, you can stay perfect, for example, five days in, in Ibera. Mm -hmm. But if you go to there, the best to me is go also to, for example, Iguazu Falls mm -hmm. and move to other places around because it's completely different landscapes and you have great opportunities too to spend three weeks or two weeks as you, as you have, as you can. Mm -hmm. 
even around Buenos Aires, because you will arrive in Buenos Aires, mm -hmm. uh, you have a lot of places in the Delta to, to spend, for example, one, two days when right, you stop right. there. Thank you. Thanks. Hey, Jay. Okay, Andrew. Hey, Horacio. Thank you for a wonderful presentation. Beautiful photographs, as, as always. Uh, I just wanted to know, uh, did you say what are the best times for, for a tour? And uh, mammal watching the same time as birds as well, the best times of the year to watch? Uh, all year round is possible to go. Of course, best time there could be around our spring because it's more concentrated the breeding season. That it means from September to November, perhaps are the best month. But really, all all year round is possible, and for mammals, all year round is the same. It's not like birds. Okay. Um, usually, you see around ten different species of mammals when you go three, four days to Ibera. Two, three kind of deer, deer foxes, uh, capybaras. Uh, that's a kind of rodents, monkeys, um, yes. But all, all year round is the same. Mm, okay, thank you. We wait for you, Andrew. Okay, Gombo. Uh, thank you. Thank you for uh, a good presentation. Um, Horacio, do you work with the Ramsar people? How many Ramsar sites run the your your site and well, uh, how how do you, the, your students they involve in in Ramsar uh, or wetland uh, conservation or protection the project? Yes, of course. Uh, in in the country, in the whole country, we have twenty three Ramsar sites. I think. Um, we have some of them very big, like more than two, 250,000 hectares. And Ibera, it's not, not the whole wetland is a Ramsar, but one part, because the, the Ramsar declaration of the area was just in one part of Ibera, and it's also a Ramsar site, but not the whole protected area. Um, mm. But for us in Argentina, Ramsar sites are very important thing. Um, a lot of people is working around Ramsar sites. Uh, right. Also, I have a, another project uh, in a different place connected with Ibera that is in the Delta of Paraná, closer to the city where I live in Buenos Aires. Um, it's called Delta of Paraná Ramsar site. Mm. But uh, yes, we, we we are very involved in, in the top, in the topic. Does hmm. does your group work on the uh, the migration migration studies of the migratory birds using the satellite devices and stuff like that? Yes, the, this work was uh, I I don't be in this uh, group. But it's part of the Wetlands Activity. Wetlands International is an organization with 50 years old in the whole world. And there are no fees, uh, 25 years uh, uh, old in Buenos Aires City from all South America with programs in Brazil, Peru, all countries. And Wetlands International is a member of France, the convention. Yep. And mm -hmm. They are developing a lot of activities in the Ramsar sites. And one of them is about the immigration of the birds and the flyway that I told you in the talk is, is a, a work made by Wetlands International. And uh, there are biologists working on this topic. All right, thank you, thank you. Yes, Mike. Parasha, you mentioned about rewilding. Uh, and uh, mentioned like there are species of birds or animals that uh, you reintroduce to the wild. So how yes. many species have you reintroduced and are you planning to in reintroduce more? And uh, number two is, uh, is there a problem with the flora for, with the plant species in Ibera? For example, in the Philippines, a lot of the plants here are 
because of the Manila, Acapulco, Galleon trade before. There's so many plants here from Central and South America. So wow. is, is there a problem also in Ibera? Um, well, about the introduction that is in charge of one big organization called Rewilding Argentina, starting by the Conservation Land Trust. Uh, I've seen there around 10 different species, uh, two birds and eight mammals. You know, three birds, uh, because they are um, a Sariema too. Um, yeah, it's, it's very nice. It's a new activity from this century. For, for that, it's still, you can see, for example, now you can see very well the green and red maco because the introduction happens uh, around seven years ago, more or less. And now you can see even in the towns, the Mako is the, the answer was amazing. But other species like shower still, there are, they are now several number of them walking in the nights in the, this big area, but uh, at the moment it's not easy to see them. Um, ah, some, somebody asked about the otters. Uh, otters are new and completely new. And I don't know exactly what happened. I know that the experience was great in the area, but I don't know how, how is the number. In, in the other side, for example, and peters and peccaries was a very successful, and some deer that they were introduced were very successful. You have hundreds of them. Sorry? Ah, we can, sorry, I think that's, I share in and I don't. Sorry. I was talking, thinking my my own computer. So um, this is about their intuition and about the that you say about the plants because in there there are some problems with, especially some trees that people use the the wood in the past, but we have not problems about the invasion of animals or plants in the area, likely. Mike, sorry, yes, sorry for me, Horacio. Yes. Uh, sorry, uh, when you say reintroduced, uh, where are some of the wildlife introduced from? You know, is, it, is it from a zoo or reintroduced from, from somewhere else? Yes, depends, because all the species, except the Mako, perhaps the altar, the other species we have on wild in other places uh, on the country. They are not extinct of the wild. But for example, the Mako that we haven't uh, in the country, for example, the last of them, they were seen uh, more than 100 years ago. But for example, in Ibera, you are 20 kilometers from the river and in the other side of the river is a, a different country, Paraguay. But in Paraguay, they are still wild. You can see there. So the reintroduction, some of, of them occurs coming from zoos, yes. And it was very hard to, to teach them how to survive on the wild, how to uh, still uh, breed, how to still uh, have food on the wild, on the forest, not human being, because they are completely wild by themselves. People do nothing. And it was very successful. I, I understand that uh, the organization uh, have a lot of experience and they have very good uh, connections with our introduction programs in, in Africa, for example, in South Africa. Uh, it's the, the first big experience in South America happened here in Ibera. I'm proud about that. And it's possible because our this century the 21st century will be the, the century of the reintroduction and the rewilding. <clears throat> yeah, uh, Horacio, there's a question uh, by Ana Lu from Ecuador on Facebook. She said that uh, last night in the news, there was a report on the lack of water in Iguazu. She wants to know how has it affected to wildlife and she said that it's very sad to see how little water there, the waterfalls. Is it true? And yeah. 
No, it was yes, but the the level you are talking about the level of the rivers. Because it's it, yes, but the river change all time. Uh, it's, it's even it's natural depending of the how big are the rains or not. Never is is dry. Dry is never. But the level of the river sometimes is lower, sometimes is higher. No, it's not a problem about that. Don't worry. Even when the the level of the water is, is lower. I love it because you can see a different landscape. It's amazing. But you have also, you have uh, the, the, the waterfalls very big. It's amazing place to go. Okay. So not really what you know, Anna said on the news is little no, water. No. Not really. No, no. Okay. Only a bit lower in the water level. Yes, people want to, to have very big news, but nothing happened. Don't worry. Ready to hear it? That's good. Okay. Yes. Iwasu Falls is very famous and uh, it's very close connection between Iberá and Iwasu Falls because you have around five hours driving from Iberá to Iwasu Falls. So people usually connect both, both places and stay four or five days around Iwasu Falls and the lodges in the rainforest. and. Yeah, the the Ibera wetlands too. It's a natural connection. There's no problem. Even this is this record low. It's... Yes, yes. No, no. It's something what happened uh, one month ago, but now it's completely recovered because we have a, a historical dry season last year mm -hmm. in all South America, Central South America, even in Brazil and Argentina, Paraguay. And the, the lower the, the level of the water was very low, but it happened after every fifty years more or less. Okay, it's natural. It's right. Thank you. Yep. Are there more questions? Yes. Uh. Yeah, Francisco. Yes. Yes, I wanted to ask about the Macaws reintroduction. Are you putting? Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, cases where they can uh, lay the eggs because the macaws need big holes and big trees yes. and it doesn't seem to have big trees in Iberá. So where are they yes. nesting? Well, first of all, I, I'm not part of their introduction program. I just am user and happy to see okay. them flying again on freedom. But yes, they, they are put in cages. They have natural holes but after more than 100 years using cages, they, the people who is in, from the wild mm -hmm. in Argentina are uh, putting cages, big cages everywhere. Even some of them were used by other species like big owls or other sure. birds. And, but they start to use it. And I don't know what will happen in the future because we have the first individuals born on wild, but they, they will need, in the future, they will need more and more holes. So they will need to use the natural holes. More and more cases. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. I hope so. Yes. <laughs> yeah. well, there are one town uh, very close to the area where they were introduced. There are one town called Loreto. That's uh, all the, the Macos start to go. And people, local people are very happy. They, the people are very involved in the protection of the species because they love to go to the town because they have big trees and they go for feeding mm -hmm. on these big trees, the, the different kind of na native trees. And these attract tourists? No, no. Ah, attract tourists, yes, yes. No, I, sure. I understood. Yes, attract attract. Tourists. So ah, yes, people attract. is happy. Yes, yeah. of course, of course. Yeah. Imagine yes, after, imagine, after 100 years, imagine to see again the macaws flying and coming to your garden, people can't believe it. Amazing. Yeah, Mike. Great. All right, then lower your hand. <laughs> All right. All right, yeah, before we move on, let's take a group photo, right? Okay. Hey. Hello, Kaki-san. Hello. Yes, thank you. Rajendra, 
<laughs> Hi, Jeffs. Hello, Rajendra. Good to see you. Fong on Hill. Hello, Fong on Hill. Yes, good. Yes, guys, look at the camera. Smile. One, two, three. Here we go. Okay. This is our first group photo. Let's go thank, on. Thank you, Victor, Mike, Andrew, Maya, and all the people from the Asian Bear Fair to make this talks that was very interesting. I, I could be in some of them. And I hope to continue with the next season. You, you should tell us when will be the next season and when, what kind of topics we will have the next season. Because you wow. should to continue. Yes, thank you. Talking about the next season, Mike. What? <laughs> what are we going to have next season? Before we before we talk about the next season, maybe Orasha should uh, tell us when we can go visit him in Ibera. <laughs> <laughs> as soon as possible. We need uh, this this virtual contact, and we need to to know the other people, the other places, the other bear fairs. Um, there are a lot of people making meetings like bear fairs that people start to make not only virtual, and um, your space could be a very interesting place for an internship, world internship. Because we are making together the, the World Bear Fairs Council, and it's, it was a very interesting platform to connect people in the whole world. So the Asian Bird Fair Execom will rest for a while. <laughs> We're planning to come back in the last quarter of the year. Uh, we'll come. We're still brainstorming what to do. Maybe a uh, uh, panel discussion, or uh, there was a suggestion from Marasho to introduce a different bird fairs in the world. So uh, we'll look into that and 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 work with the uh, speaker, the speakers from different places, and we'll see what we can do. But uh, make sure you. Uh, uh, stay tuned to our Facebook page so that uh, you'll know uh, when we make the next announcement. Yeah, and, and we welcome all the friends in the Ibia family or not, you know, just just let us know your comments or your suggestions and or, you know, what do you expect us to do? And maybe, you know, with collecting all these informations, we will make better decisions and make better arrangement next season. So probably, there, there, in, yeah, probably in, in, in September, probably. The, the reason we came up with the online talks was because we don't have the Asian Bird Fair. And usually during the Asian Bird Fair, we have the same talks about bird watching, uh, uh, ecotourism side, and also the conservation side. And which is what we did with the series. Last year, we started with the bird watching uh, aspect. And this year was more on the ecotourism and what you are doing behind the scenes. So we let all our uh, conservation NGOs, uh, we give them a chance to speak because usually during the Asian Bird Fair, we didn't have time to listen to each other's talks if you, if you notice that. So this is actually a very good opportunity for us to learn more, to, to learn deeper into what each of us uh, are doing and uh, what we are sharing to our best practices to everyone, not just in the Asian Bird Fair, but around the world. Yeah, when, when the sky is clear, you know, still we want to have a, 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 a real, you know, a bird fair in Asia. So yeah. next year, maybe we'll go to <laughs> Korea in Sunshun Bay, maybe. But uh, we know they, they are determined to do it. But it, it all depends on the, the situation of a pandemic. But I, I suppose, you know, when the vaccine's been taken most of the world, then you'll be okay. The border will be open, you know, we can travel free next two years. Hopefully, you know, for the, for the first season. Well, Sun Chon Bay is in, for everyone's information, Sun Chon Bay is in Korea. Yeah. So they, they actually sent pillars that they may, yeah, they may want to 
host the ABF in Suncheon Bay, Korea next year, South Korea next year. And one more thing I'd like to mention, uh, Professor Arakaki is working, on, Arakaki. Is working <laughs> on the ABF in Okinawa, Japan, probably in 2023. Uh, no, 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 you, you should not say that. <laughs> I'm not confident. I don't, I'm not confident. Right, you know, but, but you know, he works very yeah, hard for this. Yeah, you know, yeah. So we, we wish him a, a great success and we hope that we can meet you in, in Okinawa in 2023, you know, hopefully. <laughs> yeah. There's still so many places in Asia that we want to go to, mm. right? Nepal, Mongolia. <laughs> Sri Lanka, <laughs> yeah, so many think, different cities. Yeah, as I mentioned in my talk in, in to um, Asian Adventures earlier this week, I said that it, it, it's our dream, you know, to have ABF in every country in Asia. So mm -hmm. let's let's work on it. I want to ask, what about Indonesia and those islands over there? Uh, I didn't uh, see them here. Yeah, <laughs> there, there, there are birders uh, yeah. in, in Indonesia, but we don't have a, a, a strong local organization, you know, who are willing to do this, even a local bird fair. So, you know, in Asia, we always encourage our friends in, they, 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 they host the, uh, a local bird fair first, then it can develop to an Asian bird fair, you know, small national, so um, well, like, like uh, Nepal, Rajendra, you know, maybe mm -hmm. a, a I saw her, yeah. In Nepal first, then Asian birth fair, because I know you know Rajendra always want to have an Asian birth fair in, in, in Nepal. Mm -hmm, sure, isn't it, Rajendra? Um, yes, Victor. Yeah, um, Nepal would like to have a birth fair, Asian birth fair one day. Um, Actually, we had a plan to conduct this year or next, uh, sorry, uh, the following year, yeah, this year. I had a meeting with the ministers and the Nepal Tourism Board and they were agreed to host it. But uh, due to this uh, uncertainty, due to this uh, present uh, situations, we are not uh, able to do it, but uh, still I do have a good connection with the people from Nepal Tourism Board and uh, Minister of Tourism. So hopefully the one situation gets better. I'm sure that the Nepal will be also uh, interested or Nepal will comment and then local organization, everybody or all of us will be very happy to host you one day in my country. Yeah, we, we, are, we are not giving up yet. And we definitely one day will, will like to host <laughs> the Asian birthday in Nepal, yeah. Good luck. Good luck. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Good luck right, to all of you. Thank you, gentlemen. This is the end of this season, this session. Thank you again, Horacio, for the wonderful presentation. You are you are a very VIP speaker in Super ABF Online Talk. Thank you. Yes. Thank you so much. The, the, the pleasure is all ours. Thank you guys for your support. And I will see you in the next season. Thank you, yeah. yeah, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Victor, Mike, Andrew. Keep and in touch, guys. All right, cool. Yeah. So keep in touch. Thank you. Yeah, thank okay. you. Stay, Stay here. Safe. Stay safe. Stay safe. Stay safe. Happy. happy. Yeah. We will see you later. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. See you later. Bye. 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 Bye